My name is Daniel Aries. I am a dermatologist. I'm the head of dermatology at the University of Kansas. And I'm going to give you a dermatologist's perspective on treating cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. I also have a son's perspective on cutaneous T-cell lymphoma because in 2001, I diagnosed my father with CTCL. My treatment philosophy on cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is that we try to stamp out the disease and the signs of the disease as much as we can. One way to think about it is if there are 10 billion cutaneous T-cell lymphoma cells, there's a certain chance of mutation where one or more of them will become more dangerous. If we can take that number of cells down from 10 billion to a much, much smaller number, then the risk of progression becomes smaller as well. So we take a team approach, and the team usually includes a dermatologist who will handle a lot of the skin-oriented treatments, as well as dermatopathologists who can help with diagnosis, radiation oncologists who can help with some of the treatments like electron beam therapy, and oncologists who can also help with some of the more advanced treatments like photophoresis and some of these systemic treatments. The mainstays of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma treatment in the early stages include topical retinoids and topical steroids. A couple of important things to know about topical treatment. Don't stop early. Wait until all signs of the disease have been gone for several months before cutting back. Otherwise, the disease can come back with a vengeance when the treatment is stopped. A typical regimen for topical steroids might be five or six days a week using the topical steroid to all the affected areas. We tend to prefer ointments versus creams because ointments are less irritating and more effective. Some patients really hate the greasy feeling. For those patients, creams are okay. A typical regimen might involve using these five or six days a week, perhaps starting with something very strong like clobetazole for two weeks, then switching to something a little bit milder like triamcinolone for two weeks, then going back to clobetazole, back to triamcinolone for a 12-week cycle. And at that time, it's usually time for another visit, and then we can reassess the treatment and see if we need to change things. For areas like the face, the underarms, the groin, where skin touches skin, there we tend to use gentler steroids, something like desonide might be a typical choice. Now I said five or six days a week, and the reason for that is to leave a, one day a week where steroids are not used. On that day, I like to get my patients to use a topical retinoid, one that's approved as bexerotene. Many patients also have good success with a retinoid called tretinoin. And the retinoid has two effects. First of all, it's useful for treating cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. But secondly, the retinoid can help thicken skin up. And that helps counteract one of the main side effects of the steroids, which is to thin skin out. So the retinoids and the steroids kind of help balance each other. They both treat the CTCL. The steroids, though, can make skin thinner, while the retinoids help restore some of that skin thickness. One thing to note with retinoids is that they can make someone more vulnerable to sunburn. So patients who are getting natural sunlight or are going to a tanning booth or are getting medical tanning with narrowband ultraviolet radiation, those patients need to pull back a little bit on the light therapy when they're using the retinoid and then they can slowly build back up as tolerated. It's important to do this to reduce the risk of burning. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of rays that are used to treat CTCL. The big one for medical treatment is narrowband ultraviolet B. This is helpful because it's pretty much the safest way to get the light treatment for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. It is important, even with this modality though, to check for photosensitizing medicines. For instance, people who have high blood pressure taking kidney medicines, many of those are photosensitizing, so these patients have to start at much, much lower levels of light to prevent burning. Now, other medical treatments can include PUVA, which is the same kind of thing, but there's a sensitizer. The sensitizer is kind of like uh, lime juice, let's say. If you've ever been outside, got lime juice on your skin, you can get a sunburn much more easily. So this makes the light penetrate more deeply. However, it also brings increased risk of side effects such as skin cancers. Now, another way to go for people who can't travel that easily is to find a tanning bed. And I want to go a little bit more into the details of how you might do that safely. So if you're going to use a tanning bed, it's important to start low 
go slow, and ideally get to know the manager. Let's talk about each of these. Start low. Tanning beds can put out a lot more radiation than natural sunlight, up to five or six times more. Because of that, even if you can go outside for 20 minutes just fine, you may get a burn in a tanning bed in five minutes. So I advise patients to start with no more than one minute in a tanning bed. If you're gonna do it, I recommend Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday. It's important to take some time off between treatments. The reason is that a sunburn may not show up for 48 hours. So it's possible to get some tanning on Monday, have actually gotten enough that it's gonna cause a burn, but not know about that burn until Wednesday when all of a sudden the skin is kind of pink and painful. If someone went ahead and got more sun or tanning on Tuesday, they could be making that burn worse. So always take 48 hours off between sessions. That's again why it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday, something like that. Now, start low, take time off in between, don't increase very fast either, go slow. Add one minute per week. If you're super, super resistant to sunburns, you might be able to add a little bit more and go a little bit faster than that. But don't do too much, burning is bad. Now another point is get to know the manager. For one thing, you want to know when the light bulbs are changed. You want to stick with one machine. When the light bulbs are changed out, the machine gets much, much stronger. So you could have been going at 10 minutes and doing just great, and now the light bulbs get changed and you'll burn at 10 minutes. So you want to cut yourself back down to five and slowly work your way back up. Another reason to talk to the manager is because this is medical, not for prom, they'll sometimes be willing to cut people a deal. Okay, now I'd like to talk about soap and shampoo. How does this relate to cutaneous T-cell lymphoma? It relates to CTCL via dryness. All soaps and all shampoos, by definition, are detergents. That means they have a hydrophilic or water-loving end, and they have a hydrophobic or grease-loving end. What soaps and detergents do is they surround the natural oils on your body and they solubilize them. What that means is when you shower, your natural oils are washed away. That's why your skin feels sticky. We have, as, as humans, have not been using soap for all that long. 200 years ago, nobody was lathering up daily with Irish Spring. Dry skin can be a major problem in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And sometimes, making the skin less dry can actually help break some of the cycle with the itching, the scratching, the lesions, the dryness. One of the best ways to do that is with moisturizers. And things, simple things like Vaseline can be very helpful. But another way, and I think maybe a better way, is to avoid drying the skin out in the first place. This is challenging. So what I'm about to say may sound very strange, but I've seen it help a lot of people, and I think it's worth considering. First step is take all the soaps and all the shampoos out of the shower. Put them by the sink. Shampoo your hair in the sink. Wash the key areas, and I think we all know what the key areas are, with a washcloth at the sink. After that, you can go in the shower, but just water yourself like a flower in the shower. No soap. When you water a plant, you don't use soap, you don't use shampoo, same thing with yourself. When you're in the shower, just use water, nothing else. After you get out of the shower, dry off, but not all the way. When the skin is still just a little bit damp, that's the best time to put on the ointments for the CTCL treatment. After that, if it does not drive you crazy, put in your pajamas and go to sleep. This is a very, very effective way to take care of reducing the dryness of the skin and also boosting the effectiveness of the CTCL treatments. Okay, now I wanna talk about some things you should be thinking about to discuss with your doctor. The first one is appetite. If your appetite is getting worse, or if you're losing weight and you're not trying real hard to lose that weight, you've gotta let your doctor know right away. Another concerning symptom would be night sweats, particularly drenching night sweats when it's like someone dumped water on you at night. Not just a little bit of mild sweating here and there like pretty much all of us get, but really bad sweating in the middle of the night for no reason. If that happens, get to your doctor right away. A third thing you want to discuss with your doctor is itching. 
because itching is kind of like a scorecard for CTCL. It tells you whether or not the treatments are controlling it. So instead of trying to mask the itch with anti-itch pills, it's better to tell your doctor you're itching and then seek treatments that will control the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and that in turn will control the itching.